Hello everyone, welcome to yet another exciting session of Baiju Social Science Classes. Now today for grade 8, we are going to study more about our wonderful constitution. You know that we had put out a session for you last week on Indian Constitution Part 1. So today we are going to get started with Indian Constitution Part 2. Two. So let us have a quick recap of what we studied in the last session, right? So for those of you who did watch the video, we first went ahead and understood about the definition of a constitution. Then we went ahead and spoke about why exactly we need a constitution. And we also understood the purposes of having a constitution. So this was quite an intense session where we went into quite a lot of detail. But just in case you have missed this session, is no problem at all. You can just go ahead and catch it on our 6th to 8th channel. It is right there waiting for you. In fact, it will be a good idea for you to check it out, right? Now, in today's session, we will be learning the key features of the Indian constitution. In fact, at the end of last session, if you remember, I had asked you this question, what are the key features of the Indian constitution? So this is what we are going to be studying in detail today. But before we do that, let us understand the key factors that were responsible for defining these features. So what led us to making the features of the constitution the way it is today? The first factor was actually very interestingly India's history. How? So after being ruled for, by the British for nearly 200 years, the makers of the constitution realized the utmost importance of democracy, equality and freedom. So this was a very big factor in terms of defining the features of our uh, constitution or coming up with the features of our constitution. The next factor was actually India's diversity, right? So as you know, our country was made up of several different communities who obviously spoke different languages, belonged to different religions and had their own distinct cultures. So the Constituent Assembly, which is a body assembled for the purpose of drafting or revising a constitution, they were very aware that the laws had to be made in such a way that they accommodated the interest of all these different groups of people, right? So this was also a very important factor. And finally, the last factor that influenced the features of the Indian constitution was the socio-economic condition of India during the time of independence. See, there was widespread poverty and many injustices in, in society in the form of caste-based discrimination and lack of access to education at that time. So all of these factors greatly influenced the drafting of the Indian constitution. Now you may get a question to ask you, what were the factors that led to the drafting of the Indian constitution? Then these are the three factors that you have to mention over there, right? Okay, now let us go ahead and understand the key features of our constitution. So the constitution of India has five main features, which are number one, federalism. Number two, parliamentary form of government. Number three, separation of powers. Number four, fundamental rights. And number five, secularism. So we will be going through all of these in more detail so that you understand these properly, right? So let's go one by one and let us start with, ooh, we will start with our first main feature of our constitution, which is federalism. Now, let us understand what do we mean by federalism. So, federalism is the system of division of the government in which entities such as states or provinces, they share power with the central government. So, basically, it is a form of power sharing, right? Now, when it comes to our country, India, power is shared among three tiers of the government. 
can you tell me what these three tiers are <laughs> once again i have got it for you right here on the screen it is the center or the central government which basically talks about government or jurisdiction over the entire nation then we have the state government which is jurisdiction over the states and then we have the local government which is jurisdiction over the district or the village uh, areas both urban and local right now the question over here is that why did the constitution makers divide the power among the three tiers of government well because we know in a country as vast as india it's so big with with so many different states right so many different territories over here there are so many different um, diverse communities with di different beliefs and which is why it is very very important for power not to be concentrated on just one person sitting in the capital right you need the whole state to be governed so this was the reason that provisions were made so that different levels of government can take decisions for people across the states and thereby we have the whole country that can be governed in a correct way now the important point to keep in mind here is that each level of government draws its authority from the constitution directly right so the constitution directly lays down what the powers of, of what these each the constitution directly lays down the powers of what these three tiers should be right so exactly what does this mean it means that the state and local levels of government are not merely agents of the central government this means that they also enjoy autonomy in making decisions on various issues they are not merely obeying the what the central government says right now that having been said there is a small catch over here in india the central government is more powerful than the state or local government so on questions of national concerns for example the state and the local governments do definitely need to follow the laws framed by the central government and in fact to facilitate this the constitution provides three lists do you know what they are well let me tell you there is the union list for matters of the country the state list for matters of the state and the concurrent list which has matters that relate that are related to both so let me go a little bit more into detail about this the union list consists of 97 subjects of national importance so what would be a national importance let me put this for you in a different color so you understand what they are about a uh, national importance would be matters like for example defense now we know that defense is a very important national issue you have uh, railways for example railways is again very very important it concerns the entire nation right or post and telegraph right okay so this is national importance union list then we have the state list now the state list consists of 66 subjects i'll put this for you in a different color 66 subjects of local interest which is under the jurisdiction of the state so you're talking about things like maybe public health right uh, let me put this for you over here public health what else would be a matter of the state uh, police for example police will be under the jurisdiction of that particular state right so union list for national issues state list for uh, state issues whereas we have the concurrent list which has 47 subjects which is important to both the union as well as the state so what kind of uh, matters could you have on the concurrent list let me put it in a different color for you uh, i'll put this in white for you so what kind of uh, matters could you have over here electricity for example okay electricity you could have things like uh, trade unions for example or even uh, um, economic and social planning right so this is the way power is divided between the three tiers and i think that this division of power is quite interesting no <laughs> okay so this was feature number 1 federalism now let us go ahead and understand the next key feature of our constitution which is that india has a 
parliamentary form of government. Okay, let us understand this a little bit more in detail. We know that our country, India, has a parliamentary form of government. So what exactly does this mean? This means that the people of India have a direct role in electing their representatives. I will just explain this to you. The citizens of our country have a direct role in electing our representatives and this is done to ensure that every citizen of India is given the equal opportunity to elect their own representative. Right? So for this, the constitution also guarantees universal adult suffrage. Let me put this down for you. It's a very important term. Universal adult suffrage so that we can go ahead and uh, directly elect our representatives. Now, what exactly does the term universal adult suffrage mean? Well, it means that all citizens who are 18 years or above 18 years of age, they can directly vote for their representatives. And this ensures that we have a democratic mindset in the country where everyone can vote for their representative irrespective of barriers of gender, caste and class. Right. So if you think about it, actually, I feel like the makers of our constitution were really visionaries, right? They saw forward, they thought ahead, right? So this was the second feature. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the third feature of the Indian constitution, which is separation of powers. Now, our Indian government has three organs and the power is divided amongst these three organs. Do you know what these three organs are? Look at your screen. <laughs> These are the three organs. They are the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. Now, what do these three terms mean? Let's start with the legislature. I'll put these down in different, different colors for you. So it's easy for you to follow and you know the difference between all the three organs, right? Let's talk about the legislature. The legislature refers to the elected representatives of the country who are responsible for making the laws for the country. Okay, so India, the, in India, the legislature consists of the Rajya Sabha and the, I can hear you almost saying it, Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha. And the, this, these are the bodies that make the laws. Next, we have the executive which is responsible, and I will put it out for you in a different color, this is responsible for implementing the laws and running the country or running the government. Okay, so I'm putting over here, implementing laws. So you have the legislature that is making the laws and you have the executive that is implementing the laws. Now the executive branch consists of who? It consists of the president, and who else? The vice presidents. I'm just putting VP over here. And we're talking about a council of ministers led by who? Led by our PM or prime minister. Right? So this is the executive. Then we have the last organ, which is the judiciary. And this we are referring to basically as the uh, court system of our country. Right? So in India, we know that we have the Supreme Court as the apex court. Supreme Court. This is the apex court or the top court. And then under that, you also have the high courts as well as the lower courts. Right? And this is how it is all divided. You see over here. Now, a very important point to make note of here is that the Constitution of India states that each of these organs, right, which means we're talking about the legislature, executive and the judiciary, they should exercise different powers in order to prevent misuse of power by any one branch of the government. What does this mean? This means that each of these organs acts as a check on the other one. 
right? And it's so cool because this, if you think about it, will ensure the balance of power between all three organs so that no one organ is more powerful than the other, right? So this was the third feature of the constitution. Now, let us understand the fourth feature of the Indian constitution, which is fundamental rights. So, do you know what fundamental rights are? Well, fundamental rights are the basic human rights which are enshrined in our constitution of India, which basically they are guaranteed to, they are rights that are guaranteed to all citizens. And these fundamental rights are applied without discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender and so on. Also, the fundamental rights are enforceable by the courts subject to certain condition, right? So if you feel that your, your right has been violated, you can definitely go to court. Now, what do you think is the main aim of these fundamental rights? Well, the makers of the constitution wanted to protect the citizens from the misuse of power by the state, right? So basically, they wanted to protect citizens from the arbitrary and absolute exercise of power by the state, right? They also wanted to ensure that the citizens of India, especially the minorities, are protected against the misuse of power by the government bodies, right? So it's basically a form of protection of our rights, right? Now, do you want to know what these fundamental rights are? Well, there are actually six fundamental rights given to us by the constitution, which are, which are, let me put this down again in yellow. Number one, right to equality. Number two, right to freedom. Number three, right against exploitation. Number four, right to freedom of religion. Number five, cultural and educational rights. And number six, we have right to constitutional remedies. So you may get a question to ask you, list down the different fundamental rights or tell us what the fundamental rights are according to the constitution. These are the six fundamental rights, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and understand each of these in detail so you know if you get a question on any one of these, right? Let's take a look at our first fundamental right, which is the right to equality. Now, the Constitution of India under Article 14 has guaranteed the or granted the right to equality to all citizens. What does this mean? This means that all citizens are equal before the law and there can be no discrimination on basis of factors like uh, religion, race, caste, gender, place of birth, etc. Now, an important point to take note of over here is that the right to equality is not only the right of Indian citizens, but also the right of non-citizens. Actually, let me ask you something. Tell me, do you think that there are any exceptions to this law? Hmm? To, the, to the right to equality, are there any exceptions or conditions? Well, yes, there are certain exceptions to this law. Under Article 16, there are ex exceptions to the right of equality of opportunity in terms of matters of public employment. So what, why are these exceptions there? These exceptions are provided to protect the interests of the weaker, protect the interests of, as I think protect and I lost my way, protect the interests of the weaker and the more vulnerable sections of society, such as um, women, children, backward classes, minorities. So it's actually there to protect them, right? It's for our benefit. The constitution also gives the parliament the right to pass a law to the effect that a certain post is filled only by people residing in a certain area as they are the ones who will have the knowledge of the locality, they will know the local language, right? So they are the ones who can sort of govern that, right? Then this article also mentions that there can be a law that states that only a person professing a particular religion or belonging to a particular denomination can manage the affairs of that particular religious or denominational institution. So as you see, there are certain exceptions to this particular right, right? Okay, 
Let us move on to our next fundamental right, which is the right to freedom. Now, this is one of the most important uh, ideals, basically, if you think about it. This is one of the most important ideals cherished by any democratic society. Freedom. The Indian constitution guarantees freedom to all its citizens. And the right to freedom includes many rights such as freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly without arms, freedom of association, freedom to reside anywhere in any part of the country and freedom to practice any profession. And these are so basic in terms of freedoms, right? Now, we need to keep in mind that uh, these rights are very good and they're meant for all, but some of these rights are subject to certain conditions of state security, public morality and even friendly relations with, uh, with, with foreign countries. So what this means is that the government has the right to impose reasonable restrictions on them if these conditions are not met. So we're basically saying that there are certain conditions to the right to freedom, right? Next, the next right is the right against exploitation. Now, this is put into articles 23 and 24 of the Indian Constitution. What does this fundamental right talk about or say? Well, this fundamental right guarantees every citizen protection from any kind of forced labor. So what all do you think would come under forced labor? Well, it's very obvious, right? You have things like uh, human trafficking, which is done against somebody's will or uh, begging or child labor, etc. Right? All of this comes under forced labor. Any violation of this provision is an offense punishable in accordance with the court of law, which means that it, you can be taken to court if this is the case. But there is a catch to this right also. The constitution does not prevent the state from imposing compulsory service, service for public services. What does this mean? This what we spoke about was forced labor, right? But if you think about it, the government can anytime it wants, it can ask its citizens to, for example, join the army for the sake of protecting the country, right? So this is again very important and always conditions. So... But of course, while imposing such service, the state cannot make discrimination on the basis of religion, race, race, caste or class. So if you see, there are exceptions and there are conditions to each of these um, rights that we have, right? Then, the next fundamental right is the right of freedom of religion. Now, our constitution under articles 25 to 28 gives everyone the freedom to practice propagate and profess their religion and this ensures that equal respect is given to all religions and this is so very important right moreover if you think about it this right indicates the secular nature of indian polity and this means that the state has no official religion Right now, we will be studying a little bit more about secularism in a little bit. Okay, so we will come to that a little bit later. Now, uh, let's move ahead. Okay, and let's understand. Um, or oh, actually, before we move ahead, let me ask you this question Are you ready for a question? Well, the question that I have for you is Is freedom of religion also subjected to certain conditions? Well, yes, just like other fundamental rights, the above mentioned freedoms are also subject to public order, health and morality. So there are always certain conditions, right? Okay, next, let's move on to our next fundamental right, which is uh, cultural and educational rights. Now, the constitution under articles 29, and 29 to 30 safeguards the rights of linguistic and religious minorities. I'm going to put this down for you over here. Linguistic and religious minorities. And this again is a very important right. What does the constitution say about this right? Well, 
it says that the citizens residing in India have the right to preserve their own distinct culture, their own language, as well as their own script. And as per this right, the state cannot deny admission to any person irrespective of their race, religion, caste and language into any educational institutes run by it. Right? Isn't that great? And you know, not just that. This also, they also give the minorities the right to form and govern their own educational institutions. Isn't that cool? All right. Now we will move on to the last fundamental right, which is the right to constitutional remedies. What does this right mean? So this means that the government cannot infringe, infringe upon or curb anyone's rights. The constitution under articles 32 to 35 states that citizens can approach the courts in case their fundamental rights are violated. The constitution even allows citizens to go directly to the Supreme Court which can issue writs for enforcing fundamental rights. But what is a writ? Well, let me tell you, you may get a question like this. A writ is a written order issued by the Supreme Court of India to provide constitutional remedies to protect the fundamental rights of citizens from a violation. So basically, they can go to court if they feel their rights have been violated. And this is such an important measure if you think about it, right? Now, in addition to fundamental rights, the constitution also has a section called, let me put this down for you, Directive Principles of State Policy. What is this? Let me explain. This section was designed by members of the Constituent Assembly to ensure greater social and economic reforms and to serve as a guide to the independent Indian state to institute laws and policies that help reduce the poverty of the masses. Right. So this is done for our own good. Right. Now, let us go ahead and understand the fifth feature of the Indian constitution, which is secularism. I told you we'll be discussing it very soon. So let me ask you a question over here. Why do we call India a secular state? So let me tell you this. In India, there is separation of religion from the state and no religion is promoted as the state religion or an official religion. There is no such thing. This entails the separation of religion from the government and social, economic and cultural aspects of life. So religion is separate, right? Why? What is the need for the separation? Well, that is because in India, religion is treated as an entirely personal matter, right? And it enjoys, enjoys very high importance or very high regard in our democracy. So all religious groups in our country have the same powers without any discrimination. And this is what secularism means. They also enjoy equal respect and recognition by the state. Now, we will be learning more about this, more about uh, Indian secular, secularism in detail in our next session. So definitely stay tuned. Okay, now we've done quite a lot. So I think that it is a, it is a good idea to have a quick recap of what we studied today. We talked about the features of the Indian constitution. What were the features? Well, there were five features. We spoke about federalism. What was federalism? We spoke about it, the uh, government being divided into three tiers, which is the central government, state government and local governments. Then we spoke about parliamentary form of government, which is basically where we citizens have the right to elect our representatives through adult suffrage. Then we spoke about separation of powers, which is talks about the three organs of governments in terms of the uh, legislature, the executive and the judiciary. We spoke about fundamental rights and we said that there were six fundamental rights that uh, our constitution has for us, right? And then we went ahead and we spoke about the last uh, feature, which is secularism, all right? 
so we have done quite a lot now if you have any doubts regarding this session please go ahead and drop your doubts to us or questions to us in the comment section below and we will try our best to answer this for you or another thing that you can do actually is go ahead and uh, watch this video again and you will find that you have complete concept clarity after this right now i have a very fun and interesting question for you what is the question over here well i want to ask you who is known as the architect of the indian constitution well answer i will be waiting for your answers and for more such videos tune into our by juice 6 to 8 channel and definitely do not forget to like share and subscribe i'm gonna see you really really soon in our next session bye bye